Hi right, guys, can I get a sound check? Check. Okay, great. Um, okay, guys, so first of all, wait, uh, what happened? Are you, am I, are you guys still there? Yeah, I can tell you. Okay, great, sorry, something popped out. Um, so first of all, how are you guys doing on the on the projects? I know some of you guys have turned it in. Some of you guys are still working on it. Um, some of you guys were waiting for answers from me. Um, everybody got answers you need? So let's see, turn the email. Yeah, you have to email it back to me. Okay, guys, no? Okay. Yeah. Oh. Good luck. Um, maximum data rate. Okay, so I did get questions about the maximum data rate. So let me talk about that. Sure, max data rate. Okay. So, I had to get the maximum there. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So, let's talk about first. I think the temp is the easiest one. So, what you have to do to change the temp. So, what's, what's happening with the temperature, right? So, at so to first order, your IDS sets your um, sets your uh, speed. Okay. So how does it set your speed? You've got you know you got a PMOS and you got an NMOS, and you essentially have a capacitive load. Okay. So this is your so this is your load, load. Um, you know, it's, it's, this is linear, this is nonlinear capacitance because the gate capacitance changes, but in all cases, it's capacitive, okay? And so what you're doing is you're pumping current into here, your, this current IDS to get this point to go up so you're you know to go to rise you're pumping current in there and then you're taking current out to make this point go down so assuming this is set what you want is a large ids to get or a certain ids to get to a certain rise and fall time so i guess so we're talking about temperature and remember that for example, let's say when you're getting, let's talk about the fall time, okay? Let's say NMOS is dealing with the fall time. It's easier for me to remember that. This transistor goes from saturation to linear during the fall time, okay? So initially it starts off at saturation where you're talking about um, mu C ox W over L VGS minus VT squared. Is the, is the current IDS. And then in linear mode, then eventually, so it starts in saturation. So starts here in saturation. And then it moves to linear. So, and in linear it's, so this is a two, in linear it's mu C ox, W over L, VGS minus VT minus VDS over two, 
times VDS, something like that. So in all cases, what happens is this mobility changes the temperature, V sub T changes the temperature. So at higher temps, IDS goes down. So you slow down. So circuits, so I should say CMOS, digital circuits, uh, the circuits get slower at higher temperature. Okay, because you're, you're basically your drain source current's going down at higher temperatures. Okay, at lower temperatures, I didn't ask you guys to look into this, but um, the IDS goes up and circuits get faster. Again, CMOS digital circuits get faster. Okay, so also what happens here is the power consumption goes up, but we, we're not gonna look at that. Um, so, uh, what you do is when you are designing a circuit in real life, um, you design it so that your customer can use it in reasonable environments. So let's say, you know, you're in, uh, uh, let's say early morning, even in LA, the outside temperature might be close to freezing, right? It might hit 32, 33 Fahrenheit or something like that. So at that point, your circuits inside your cell phone when you first turn it on or you come out to turn on your car, your circuits are, the car is actually a good example because a lot of us park outside. So your circuits are all sitting there being getting cold all night, okay? So they might in fact be, well, Maybe, maybe they're, they're at zero degrees Celsius, maybe they're lower, okay? And vice versa, if you've got your same car um, sitting outside, it's parked somewhere and it's like a heat wave and the temperature outside, I don't know. I don't know what, what uh, easily to calculate Fahrenheit to Celsius, but uh, you know, I guess I could see easily your in Celsius, I would guess, you know, 100 or something, maybe maybe 50 degrees Celsius, I don't know, something like that. And then you gotta think about, well, the, the chip itself is sitting there inside your car. It's been kind of like cooking all, all day. It's, you know, it's hard to remove the, the heat. You know how hot a car gets. So it, it, gets, it gets hot. So what you do, you have to make sure your circuit works on either of those extremes in terms of speed. And the, the command is dot temp in spice, dot temp. And you say dot temp, um, I don't know, minus 20 or dot temp 85. And what this does is, and then you run your simulations normally. If you leave dot temp alone, means most of the time they're not specifying a dot temp. There's a default that Spice uses, which I think is 20 degrees Celsius. I'm not 100% sure, maybe it's 30 degrees, but there is a default that Spice is using. If you actually specify the dot temp, so this is a statement you put in your spice stack dot temp that actually uses that temperature to simulate at that temperature. And this is, these are, by the way, our junction temperatures. Means the temperature at the actual chip. So it doesn't, so let's say, the chip has got its own power consumption. You're not, you haven't done a good job of removing the power or you simply can't. Um, the ambient is at 55 degrees. It's very possible the junction temperature might be at 85, it might be at 125. It's not uncommon. Just because the chip itself is gonna, is gonna heat up because of its own power consumption, the fact that you can't remove all the heat. 
Okay. There's also, you can also use the dot temp to do, um, you know, sort of a temperature sweep. You can set a starting and ending temperature and then a temperature step. So you get multiple simulations of the same statement. I think it's just easier to set it to one value and then another one and just re-simulate and get the data. Does that, does that answer your question? Let me see if you guys got some stuff on chat about the temperatures. Oh, uh, lost, I have to add it in answer to the add the my comment of the transient. So no, you don't, um, so you don't comment out the transient. You're still doing the transient simulation. You add the dot temp to the, to that deck where the, you know, where you've got dot transient or dot DC. So you add dot temp as yet another line. Yeah, thank you. Clayton mentioned that 27 degrees is the default. Any, any other questions, guys? Okay, so we got, um, okay, so, that was the temp. Um, now the the maximum speed. So yeah. So there's a long answer to the maximum speed. I, I'm not, as you guys can tell, I'm not a don't have a short answers for you guys because I think some of these are very very important. Okay, so very, very important concepts. So there's the short answer to max data rate. Okay, and that basically says that, let's say I wanna have a zero, one, zero transmitted, zero, one, zero, one. So essentially like a clock or something. Okay, so what typically people say is I'm gonna, the maximum I can have it is, let's say my rise time is, so this is what I want. So want, and red is sort of what's allowed. So let's say I, I use half of this time to transition. So this is, if this is, um, say t, this is t over two. So I'm gonna use half that time to transition and I'm gonna have a valid high level for half the time. And so on, and same with the fall time. So I'm gonna have half this time to transition and half the time to have a valid value here. Okay, so now let, like why wouldn't you have, I guess the question is, okay, this gives you a certain data rate, right? So this sets, let's say you already have a rise fall time. Okay, it says basically the maximum T you can have is twice the rise time or twice the fall time, which are, whichever one's I guess the slowest. Okay, to have this. So the question is, why would you have this? By the way, a bunch of you guys, like in the project one, you guys really went like really, really too fast. Because if I look at your, you know, this was in, this is what, I don't know, this is out. And this is the mid, I guess, in between, right? So in was doing something really fast. And so mid was doing this kind of sawtooth thing. And then out was kind of working, but this really doesn't work. And I'll tell you why in a second, okay? That this value has to get to the full results. Otherwise, you know, this you can, you can get fooled by looking at this output and looking at it transitioning, but you'll have a serious problem with this. If you, you gotta at least, at the very, very least, you have to make sure you reach your VDD and ground at these, at the very least, even if you don't dwell this much here, at the very least, you gotta get to this point. Okay. 
Okay. I mean, I'm, I even shudder to tell you guys that you really need to do something like this. Now, why do you have to, oops, why do you have to, let's just talk about this for a second. Why do you have to spend this time dwelling here? Okay. It's because when you're transmitting, remember we're transmitting data from one chip to another. Okay. So this is chip one. It's sending some data to chip two. Okay. So you got to remember all this stuff's kind of happening in chip one. There is some clock in chip one. So let's call it clock one happening. So it's going to have, so if I put it in, this is time. So let's say this is the waveform. So, you know, clock one is doing its thing. Okay, now you're sending, so this is data. And typically what you're doing is you're also sending out, this is not typical, it's called source. Um, well, it is in the way we're simulating, okay? So it's called source synchronous clocking. The reason I'm going into such detail is because you know, like you're gonna, you guys are gonna see this source synchronous clocking versus clock embedded in the data. So let's say your source synchronous clock, clocking means that you are actually also transmitting a clock along with your data. Because at some point you need to synchronize your data, you need to sample your data values out, out here in chip two. And so you can set, set a bunch of data typically. So you get data, zero, data one, you got a whole you know, bus of data and you use, you have one clock with say, you know, 16 bits of data, or 32, uh, so sorry, not 32 bits, um, a 32 bit wide data bus or a 16 wide data bus or an eight bit data bus, they all get a single clock that they, they're gonna synchronize to. So, the problem is with the source synchronous clocking, it's really easy to implement. So it's used a lot in simple data transmission systems at lower speeds, like we're talking about now. Uh, the reason it's simple is because you don't need any specialized circuits. You're just transmitting a clock along with data. But the problem is that the connection, this, this line here, may be different than the line drawn here, than the line drawn here. I'm talking about in your printed circuit board, okay? Or the package pins are by nature different, et cetera. So depending on, you know, you only have one clock, okay? So let's say the clock's doing something like, like this, okay? Your data might vary between this and there might be another one that might be somewhat delayed, someone that might come a little early, but you want all of them to be valid for some period so that a single clock can sample all of them. So they need to be valid for a certain reasonable amount of time. And so that's the reason why you want this, this valid period. So you want it, you can transition for a while, but then you gotta stay valid for a while to, to sample on the clock edge. So that's why you need this, this period, okay? So that's what the suggestion I gave as a reasonable value for your bit period, your maximum bit period which is, sorry, your minimum bit period, which sets your maximum data transmission, which you use half of it for rise or fall time, and the other half to be steady. Let's see. 
So is so Sophia asks, so is max data rate always half of the time the output is one? My output looks like it's reaching clock one for three quarters of the logic one. Sophia, can you tell me more? I'm not sure. Let me actually draw two things for you. I don't know which one of these I mean. Do you mean that you have a situation where you're you're like you're like this or you're like this? Which is it is it case one or two or is it something else? My output kind of looks like it doesn't look like um half of it is reaching logic one. It looks more like um the second one. So it looks like this guy. I oh not to that extent, but kind of. Okay. Well, so what that means is that this what your bit rate should really look like is this. So means that you are going too fast for your circuit, for for what's allowed with your circuit. So you need to make your bit period longer. So you spend for getting it like here, you need to make this guy wider so it stays stable for longer. Does that make sense? Uh, like my output looks like it's, I, I guess like um, part of it looks like um, half of it is logic one, but it's just like that small fraction of it that's not like quite giving me exactly half. Hmm. Like, I'm not sure if this is like good enough or if it needs to be like exactly half of it. Um, so can you say that again? Sorry, I'm having a hard time visualizing what you mean. Um, I, can, well, like, I can have you share your screen. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, let me see how I do that. Yeah, there we are. Oops, what happened? I lost you. Wait. Sophia, are you there? Uh, there yes. You. Okay, sorry. Let me coast. Ooh, now I made the Sammy the coast. Well, why is this thing doing this to me? Sorry, guys, this thing is like all over the place. Give me one more second. Sophia, my co host, and co host. Okay, so I think hopefully I got that. Go ahead. Um, oh yeah, you have to stop sharing. Oh, uh, stop sharing, okay. All right. Okay, so this is the output of oh. my first case. So is this like, it's not quite 50, it's like, is this what you were looking for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So actually, so what, what, what it looks like there is you could go a little bit faster. Mm. You see what I'm saying? So your green, the width of your green could shrink a bit and you could make it 50 by shrinking the green. And that means you could go to a higher data rate. Does that make sense? So right now, look at, looks like the width of your green is, I don't know, like a nanosecond, right? Something like mm -hmm. that. Uh, is it like this pulse here? Oh yeah, so, so you're staying 2 point, I'm sorry, it's 2.5. So your width of your green is 2.5 nanoseconds. So it looks like, you know, you could make the width of your green, uh, so that would be the number that comes after 0.1. So that 2.5 and the first one you were you were playing with 
is the delay. It's when when you start the rise fall times, but the width is that second one where you have your cursor on. So if you make that, I don't know, make it two, two nano, and make your period. Sorry, make your period four. So instead of five nanoseconds, make it four. Uh, uh, sorry, make it four point two. The reason for that is you also have to include the rise and fall times. So, mm -hmm. so 4.2 it works. So try simulating with that. So you just went from a, a, sort of a two and a half nanoseconds to two nanoseconds um, and you're still okay. So you could probably even shrink it a little bit more, I guess I, you know, um, so it went from, um, so maybe make it, I don't know, um, one point, um, I don't know, like 1.6 or something. And, um, and you gotta change the period too, sorry. Um, so that you may gotta make the period 3.4, I guess. That, that might start getting too fast. Let's see. Yeah. So now you're kind of, you're, you're pretty much there. Maybe, maybe we overdid it there. But mm -hmm. notice you went from a 2.5 nanosecond bit period to 1.6 nanosecond bit, bit period. Your, each one of those periods, bit periods, you're transmitting one bit. So the shorter that period is, it means you're, you're higher the data rate you have. So from here, like, how, what do I look at, look at to find the data rate? So you're at, your bit period is 1.6 nanoseconds. So that means mm -hmm. every one point, no, let's let me, sorry, let me, let me put it this way. Every 3.4 nanoseconds, mm -hmm. you can transmit two bits. Right, or you can think of it as every 1.7 nanoseconds, you can transmit one bit. Okay, does, okay. That, does that make sense? Because you have to also include the rise and the fall time. You have a 0.1 nanosecond rise, 0.1 nanosecond fall. So every 1.7 nanoseconds, you can transmit one bit. So your data rate is one over that. Okay, so it's basically 588 megabits per second. Mm. So think about data rate. Data rate, data is data, right? Your, our data, we've got binary data. So it's zeros and ones. So we can set one bit per period of time, because we have a digital binary transmission system. So that's the data. And the rate is how fast you can change, send that data. So this is 1.6? Um, it's it's 1.7, because you've got to include the uh, rise the, or okay. the fall time, depending on which, which, which bit you're you know, connecting to, does mm -hmm. that make sense? So another way to look at it is every 3.4 nanoseconds, you're, you can send two bits of data. In this case, you're sending a zero and a one in those 3.4 nanoseconds, but it could be one, one, you know, one, zero, zero, zero. Hey, professor. Does that, does that make sense? Uh like um so like the output right now it doesn't really look like it's at half so like would my previous circuit would have been like a better option like for an output um it would have been it would have been safer for sure okay but um how should i put it so it's you know it's basically it's like this is okay, I guess. I would I would feel okay calling like this is um this data is gonna transmit okay. The previous design? 
No, I, I think this one would work. Oh, this one? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So now I have a question also. So your the blue is where is the blue? Where are you which one? Right here. Okay, good. So you do not want to be looking at the output of your second inverter in this case, because you might have some really you know, contempt bad data on that point, which you just pointed to, but that inverter may make it look may may look make it look okay and deceive you. All right. Okay. Okay, thank you. Sure. Professor. Yeah. I had like another question kind of piggybacking off that. So whenever you're speaking about the data rate, you're you're speaking as like bits per second or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, but I already, already submitted my project, but I had it in basically frequency terms. Is, is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. I just, I just put it as the, the highest frequency we could go to. Sure. Yeah. Okay. That works. Oh, I just, Only, uh, sorry, sorry, Clayton. I'm, I'm going to, because I'm going to sort of talk a little bit only in the context of this project, generally speaking that is not correct yeah yeah okay, okay. Well, we'll yeah. talk about that because i just love beating that point to death. yeah okay so hang on to that thought somebody else was going to comment at something i'm sorry i cut you off uh, i couldn't tell who it was oh uh yeah i think it was me i was just going to ask uh so like where do we kind of start um where we call it stable i was kind of going off about like 10 percent ish yeah yeah you could you could call that stable, or you could call VDD stable. Okay. Yeah. So uh, Nathaniel asked, "Can we submit to correct our maximum data rate?" Yeah. Feel free to resubmit. But you know, if you got frequency, it was there, it's fine. Okay, so so let me go back to let me share my screen again. Beat this to death because man, we used to like. But don't beat this point to death. One of you guys are gonna is gonna make this mistake like I did at. At the, in the real world and be somewhat embarrassed. Okay, so um, Clayton um, mentioned, or we were just talking about frequency versus data rate. Okay, is that the same? Well, it's the same because, you know, in this project, we're not being too sophisticated, but generally it is not the same because when you're talking about frequency, this is getting really nitpicky, but it's if you're designing data transmission circuit, it's not nitpicky. It's like it's critical, important, and it will get you seriously burned if you don't pay attention. Frequency, this is I'll be careful what I say here. This is, in my in my opinion, should only be used for a clock. Okay, and data rate or bit rate should be used for data. Okay, so what's the difference between those? There's a critical difference between those clocks always do this pattern of zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. Okay, they're doing, they're doing this by definition. Okay, data does whatever pattern data wants. Okay, it might do, you know, zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero, one, one. I don't know, some random, like do what imagine that data coming at you from this video stream, coming at your computer. It's like, it's basically sort of, you know, going through the pixels um, of the screen, you know, sending that information to you. It could be anything, depending on how I'm waving my hand 
um, if if you know if this if this uh, uh, pencil was white or black or red or whatever, it'd just be all over the place and it's constantly changing. Okay, so but the clock would always does the zero one zero one zero one zero one. Okay, so you can get away with like murder on a clock because you it's very predictable how this data is coming and this is kind of goes back to what i was talking about with this intermediate sawtooth results that you know in this intermediate point the reason why this does not work and i saw this in some of your project ones in a real extreme way it looks like it works because here you're transmitting 0101. This is what you want to transmit, which is only again in this project. In this project, we're not putting in some, some actual data looking things which might have any sequence of bits. We're transmitting 010101. So what happens is even if even if you're going way too fast for your circuit, it it's gonna sort of, um, even if it does not fully transition, it's kind of gonna, it, it's kind of stabilize itself. Say this is VDD and this is ground. Because I've got this perfect 50% duty cycle input, it's kind of it's going to stabilize itself around this midpoint and although i have really bad noise margin and so on not even discussing that but it's going to sort of stabilize itself around this point and it's going to sort of give you you know these 0101 on the output and it looks like everything's okay but look at what would happen if you do not have that you do not have 50 percent duty cycle results okay so let's say you've got a situation where um, this intermediate point again so you've got your input and you've got your you know this is your chip one chip two and let's say this thing is doing this thing only if you have this 50 percent duty cycle now let's say what happens if you got a long sequence of so a long sequence of ones followed by a zero. What it would look like is again I'm drawing this guy. Because you have so again you're going to have a long sequence of ones followed by a zero. This is your input. Okay. So this intermediate point, so let's say this is VDD of the intermediate point. No, so sorry, this is bad. Say this is this guy. During this period, okay, this intermediate point, because it's getting so many ones here, it's got time to go all the way to ground. Okay, so it gets a good zero. But when it gets to this point, it's gonna get, it's only gonna transition a little bit. So it might go up by, you know, ground plus, I don't know, 100 millivolts or something, because this period is only one one bit and you're starting because you had such a long period of all outputs being grounded you 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 went all the way to ground so when you get this your rise time is so bad you'll get nowhere close to vdd over two you might go to 100 millivolts or 200 millivolts before you go down again before you get another another bunch of bits so it'll do that and then let's say for the sake of discussion, why I should have erased this.
And then let's say you get into a situation where you had a bunch of zeros now. So this guy would then go like that, at some point achieve a good one after missing, after missing a bunch of like here, it's not getting the correct value at all. Eventually, if you got enough, enough of these guys, it'll, it'll settle in. So, and then let's say you get another, like a high, oops. So you'll, you'll see that. So the same thing that looks like it's working okay when you're transmitting 50% duty cycle 010101 because it got itself biased at this halfway, at this VDD over two point and the output looks okay. If you try to send real data through it, it's gonna completely crash and burn. It's not gonna work. And the reason for that is, you know, data is not sort of a stable, it's just, it is what it is. It's whatever it's coming out. Okay, so that's why it's important to fully transition to a good high and a good low, even when you're doing this sort of 50% duty cycle and why you can get away with a lot more when you're sort of putting your clock clock together in terms of the frequency. Any, any you guys, does that make sense? Makes sense to me. Yeah. Anyway, I just, God, we got, I got burned. I, I like a lot of people I know got burned with this thing because in school, you're just used to 50%. You know, you're just simulating with this like really fake, um, you know, you're, you're simulating, so it wouldn't be fake if you're transmitting, a, you're simulating a clock working, but you, you know, what we're doing is really kind of a real cheat when we're using zeros and ones to transmit, to try to simulate data. And it, it can, if you're not careful, it can really burn you. Does this make sense, Clayton? Does, does this make sense why? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. All right, so Justin, regarding driving our drivers, since we're starting with our values from project one and scaling up, can you use more inverters beyond the three specified? Yeah, you can use more than three inverters if you like. Yeah. Oh, yeah, also the uh, inverter one in part two, is that supposed to be the same values as in part one or is that is it separate? Uh, by part one and two, you mean in the, the question one and two of this project too? Yeah. Let me pick up the question. Or what I'm, yeah. Let me just one second. Um, two. Yeah. So I think, Michael, if you're asking, so in part, let's see, in part one. Yeah. So what you're doing is in part one, whoops. You're, if, if this was a real project at, at work, okay? So somebody would come to you and say, Hey, design me a 10 milliamp output driver. That would be your task. Okay. And so what you would do is you would start with the output stage and the output stage is what we're design designing in part one. Okay, is output stage. And because you were told to make it 10 milliamp out the driver, you would make these a certain size. Okay, so again, you, you'd, you'd set it so it's pumping out 10 milliamp under certain circumstances. Um, since it's kind of convoluted, and I, you know, I'm not gonna get to that, but let's say this gives you a certain size. 
And then there is a minimum, if, if you're being asked to design this output driver, then they'll specify also an input capacitance to this driver for you. So that whoever's using this driver in their chip knows what they're driving. So in this case, what I'm saying in part two is I'm gonna say that the input stage, the input capacitance, the input stage is your um, inverter from project one. And you're still gonna keep your output driver stage. And you're gonna figure out like how to scale things up from, from what you have. So effectively what would happen is you would get told, hey, make the input, input capacitance of this, this output driver, make the input capacitance X, which would be the size of your input driver from project one and make the output drive be 10 milliamps because that's what I want. And then you would sort of design everything in between. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. So the output of the last stage should be 10 milliamps for this part? Yeah, given the, remember that I think I've specified how to how to simulate that. Okay. Yeah. Anybody got a question about how to simulate that? No. All right, guys. Um, 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 um. Demonstrate that. Can you, uh, Sophia, can you say what you mean? Just how to like simulate um, the output current from that. Oh, yeah, yeah. So if you. Um, also, I was wondering um, would it be the same if we started from 120 micrometer? Like if we started from 120 and scaled up? Uh, can you say a little bit more? Same as, same as what? Um, so for the drivers, if we ah. started from 120 and scaled up by three times, would it be the same? Mm. So let me, let me, let me talk through the procedure and then you guys you correct me Sophia if that answers your question or not. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So so again, so let me see. So at work in like a real place again, what you would be asked to do is, and this is this is pretty typical, right? So somebody asks you to design a circuit. So design a circuit. They're gonna give you some specifications. And these are typically specifications at the periphery of this black box they're trying to design. The reason I'm calling it a black box is your manager, unless they're sitting in a design review, doesn't care how you designed it, as long as it's a robust circuit and it does everything he's asked you to do or she's asked you to do. Okay, so what are the things we're saying? So one of them is that the output has to be a certain amount of current. This is the way the outputs are defined. So the way you look at them is you have, you know, your inverter has a PMOS and an NMOS, your last stage. So this is your output. So for whatever reasons, the industry is defined this as being, when I put my input of this guy at ground, I'm gonna put a voltage source here at VO.
OH, okay? So basically the OH e output on, so that's the minimum voltage. So let's say this is, uh, this might be OH is, that's the, that's the minimum valid high voltage. Okay, so let's say this is, well, so this is at, uh, let's call this 90% of VDD. Okay, and then I'm gonna see at this voltage, which is the same for, if I, if I asked you for a 10 milliamp driver or a two milliamp output driver, that voltage would be the same. Okay, it would be at 90% of VDD, except in the case of the 10 milliamp, I'm gonna have 10 milliamp of current flowing into the output. And in the case of the two milliamp output driver, I would have two milliamps going into the output. Okay, but this VOH would be the same for with the input being a ground. And then you would make the output a VDD input. And then you would put a voltage here that would drive this point to VOL. And then it would have a certain 10 milliamp of current sink capability. Then you would, so you'd size this guy to have 10 milliamp of sourcing into VOH. And you'd sign, size this guy to have 10 milliamp of current sink from VOL. And I talked a little bit about this a couple of um, lectures ago, but the reason for this whole methodology is that whoever's using your chip, all they care about is how much current you're pumping out and in so they can design their capacitive load. So, so that's the methodology for getting this, this guy sized up, okay? So now you've sized up this guy, this is a certain size, okay? So let's just for the sake of amusement, call it, so for sake of discussion, not that this is the right number, I'm gonna just say width is 200 microns, and length is 0.18 micron. And this width ended up being about 116 micron. L is equal to 0.18 micron. Again, these are not the right values, but let's say that's what you ended up with to pump out and pull in 10 milliamp respectively. Okay. So then this is how you design your output stage. Okay. Now, the other important part of this thing is what is, you know, somebody, so that's some, your somebody is gonna be, let's, is gonna be using this thing to charge and discharge their capacitances. But then somebody on the inside of the chip, another designer is gonna be using this circuit of yours to transmit data, right? So he's he's doing I don't know, he's designed some some functional block and he's trying to get that to this guy. And so he needs to know how he can drive this guy. If you just make this the input, you just make the input to this guy of this size device. This guy is gonna be a little sad because this is a very large capacitive slope, um, a large capacitive load for him to drive. This this guy is like designing, you know, Verilog. He's not really worried too much about designing large loads. He's, he's dealing with sort of minimum size devices and so on. So to make it easy for him and the rest of the team, there's a bunch of 
team members using this output driver. I mean, you could use it here, somebody else you could be using it somewhere else. What they do is they ask you to have an input to this circuit that is reasonable. So reasonably small load, reasonably small load. So that the person doing, you know, using this circuit block can easily drive it. And what is that reasonably small load? It's different for each one of you guys, but it's the size of the inverter used for project one, because that's a small value and it's different for each one of you guys. Okay, so let's say for the sake of discussion, this guy, let me actually, So it's different for each one of you guys, but let's say this width was, uh, I don't know, uh, it was uh, 10 micron, length was 0.18, and this width was uh, four micron, length was 0.18, let's say. Okay, so now this is a much more smaller capacitance. So the capacitance of this guy, is roughly, what would it be? Um, maybe, maybe it's just like two to five femtofarads, whereas the input capacitance of this guy is uh, maybe, what would it be, 160, well, maybe, it's, maybe it's like, 40 to 50 femtofarads, maybe I'm wrong about that. But sort of this input capacitance is pretty small and easy to drive for even small devices. Now, the, the thing is they've made the driving of this thing your problem. So this guy's happy, but they've made your problem that you've got to somehow drive this guy starting with a small device. And the way you deal with that situation, I didn't prove this to you guys, but what you do is you put in other stages here to get the, opt the optimal speed. You put other stages in between and you progressively scale up the size, the width of the stages. So it might make the width of this guy be 40 micron and the length be 0.18, and this width be, um, I don't know, um, say 20 micron, and the length being 0.18. Okay, and then you might have need to make it yet another stage. And what I didn't prove to you guys was that this scaling from stage to stage, the optimal number is something like three to four X per stage. Okay, so you might, depending on the size of this and the size of this, you might need to put in one stage or you might need to do two stages, depending on just the, the size of this the starting point with the size of that, okay? And this scaling, okay? Now, the reason you don't have to be too careful about this is because I, I kind of mentioned this maybe in pat maybe too much in passing during um, or or um, uh, another lecture was that let's say this graph is the number of stages. Sorry, no, no, not number of stages. The scaling multiple per stage. And this is the overall delay. It turns out that it's kind of at the optimal point, it's a pretty flat curve. So if you have, if per stage, your, 
you know, multiplying by a factor of three or four between stages in terms of the width increase per stage, it's, you know, not that different. So between, let's say this is two and this is five. So, you know, if you're, if you're going, if you're increasing the ratio of the size of your stages, too quickly, it's not much worse than a three or four. So I think Michael asked, was it Michael um, was asking whether, you know, how many stages you put in, should you put more number of stages? You know, you could, you could go to a factor of five increase in width and you probably won't suffer that much if you had one. But if there's an extreme, you don't wanna be like a factor of, six or eight or something like that. But if it's like two to four to you know, five, it's, it's, it's fine the, in terms of the size. It's not gonna make a huge difference in the overall, the overall delay. So first, is, is Michael, did that, did that make sense? What I just said? Does that affect the number of stages you would have here? Oh, I think uh, Justin asked that. What's that? I think Justin asked that. Uh, oh, Justin, sorry, yeah. Justin. But it makes sense to me now. Okay. Oh, makes sense to Justin. Okay, now back to Sophia. Did that answer your question, Sophia? Um, yeah, kind of. Um, because like initially I thought that like the way that it was worded in the um, in the project two, because it says assume inverter four is the size of your original inverter one. Uh -huh. And so I thought that was the one that we just made with a 10 milliamp. So then I scaled up from the one that we just designed from the part one. Oh, I see, gotcha. And I, I don't know, um, because like, I think in one of the lectures, I thought that's what you said too. So that's what I did. So it seems like I had to scale down kind of. Hmm. I, yeah. see. I said original, but I didn't say original project one. Yeah, so that's why I, I just scaled up from the one that we just designed by getting the 10 milliamp. So mm -hmm. that's why I was wondering if it's if the output makes a difference if we scale up. Yeah, so you, you, so, sorry, I guess that is, that is uh, um, you could take that the wrong way. So it should be the, your original project one and one. Yeah, I, I, did, I wasn't sure if, I didn't know we were like referring back to project one. So let's see, Alexandria is saying, I'm still a bit lost on the max data rate. He wants to show you just the graphical output. Um, can you, Alexandria, can you tell me, does it still lost? Can you say a little bit more? Yeah, I guess I was, I kind of, I understood like the work Sophia did of like getting that specific response by making that time shorter, but are I guess are you just looking like when we make that smaller, like why we made those values that way, or are you looking for like a specific? Should we be like trying to calculate something specific? Hmm. I I would like you to give me. I mean, we can. I'd like to see the graph, but I would also like you to give me a specific number because I want you to think about what data rate means. So what are you, what are we trying to accomplish here? We're trying to get a whole lot of data as fast as you can between the between two points. That's what we like any any kind of transmission systems, data transmission systems trying to do. 
or data communication systems trying to do. So I want to make sure you like you that that concept is clear in your mind and what you know a particular bit period means in terms of the data rate. So I'd like to see a particular like a number for data rate from you. Does that does that answer your question? I think so. Yeah. And do you do do you know how to get that now from what I said, or do does it this still seems seems fuzzy? Still, I, I guess a little fuzzy. So I guess what you're looking for is when we make that smaller, do you want to see how many data points we're getting in between those like or I guess like if like one section is like the one I think it was like the 1.7 like nanoseconds, are we trying to see how many data points we're getting in those 1.7 seconds? No, no, no. Oh, okay. I see your confusion. So 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 the data rate is this is the meaning of the data rate. Okay. So let's say what you're asking is, does a data rate mean if I'm if I'm correct? Let's say this is what's going on in your um, in your output, and you're you're thinking your data rate means how many points you got in between. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. So no. So this your in this period, what the data rate means is in this period of time. So this is time. I'm trying, to, trying to figure out like what's the what's the most generic general thing I can tell you. Okay, so this is the most generic thing I can tell you. So what we are doing in this class as a, as if like a general about like I was gonna say something general about this class is we are looking at what digital data looks or digital looks like in the real world. Okay, so if you say digital stuff, right, let's say you're taking a digital class, quote unquote, right, you're talking about zeros and ones and um, you're talking about adders, NAND gates, whatever it is, right? Logic, okay? So this is a digital system. Okay, so I could ask you the same thing about a digital system. So let's say if you were gonna look at this whole question as, as a digital system, okay? So in a digital world, these inverters, wouldn't have transistors in them. There'd just be some abstract concept in a digital system, right? In the digital system, the only definition of an inverter is if in is zero, out is one, and if in is one, out is zero. Okay, and same thing with that guy. In a digital abstraction, there is no rise or fall time, okay? There's no supply voltage. In fact, there's no voltage. There's just ones and zeros, okay? In, a, in an abstract digital system. So in that case, if we were gonna look at this point as a function of time, you would just end up with zeros and ones. in a purely digital system. Does that make sense, Alexander? What I'm just saying about a digital abstract system? Yeah. Okay, so in that case, your, uh, your data rate 
would be how long it takes you to transmit a bit. So here is a, a one, there's a zero. Here's like, I don't know, two ones. Here's another zero. There's a one. There's a zero. There's a one. Again, so we're saying this, this is the amount of time it takes to transmit a one. So if I have, so that is the inverse of my data rate. So if I had, for example, if I had this much time, I could get this much, this many bits through if each one of my bits took this long. Does, does that, does data rate make sense to you in a digital context? Yeah. So okay. it's like for like the whole, like, I guess in this case, like for a whole segment of time, you would want to see, I guess, like, the, or I guess like the max bit rate for getting a one and then a zero and then the one and the one again? Yeah, so for example, let's say the max, let's say, I mean, that was just an example, right? It could be any sequence of data. But again, if you're talking about a purely digital abstraction, you're like, let's say, you know, you guys, I'm sure you've heard of gigabit ethernet, right? You can buy a computer with gigabit ethernet or something, or, or they say my Wi-Fi communication has 50 megabit per second. That's your data rate. So 50 megabit per second means each second I can transmit or receive 50 million bits of data. That means they took their second divided by 50 million. So each bit takes a certain amount of time. And that's, this is how they end up with this data rate of 50 megabit per second. So that's from a digital abstraction. Okay. Now the problem is the real world is not this digital abstraction. The real world has got voltages and rise time and fall times. So the real world has what you guys are kind of simulating. So it doesn't look like this. It kind of looks like that. Oops, I'm probably not something. So it looks like that and that and that and that and that. So what you're doing is when you're simulating, you are responsible as the designer who's doing this project, let's say you, you were working as an engineer or whatever, you were responsible to do all the stuff we're talking about to make this a reasonable, so that the digital designer could use this as a, pretend that this was a, a, a perfect bit being transmitted. So everything we're doing, let's say we're, we're taking half the period for the rise time, staying stable for a while, means that now the digital designer can pretend like this, this funky circuit, this funky rise time, or this fun, funky timing looks like a perfect one. And then this looks like a perfect zero. So, so the values here are not the data rate. These are just the stuff you need to do to make this look like a legit one uh, or a legit zero, et cetera. The data rate is actually what the digital designer can use this at to, to get data through the system. That, that might be too general of an answer, but does that, does that make sense? Yeah, I guess my question now is there like a, I guess like a certain threshold that's like usual? Because I think in the announcement you said it would be like half of uh, the rise and fall times is half of the bit period. Right. So what you would want to do is to make your rise time be sort of half of this period, half of this time, and then you want to stay stable for the other half. So let's say let's say your rise time is let's say it's um, one nanosecond. 
So let me make it easier. This is, I'm just making this up, okay? Rise time, let's say it's 0.5 nanoseconds. And the fall time is also 0.5 nanoseconds. Okay, so what I'm saying is this, this time is 0.5 nanoseconds. Then I'm going to stay stable for 0.5 nanoseconds. So my bit period is 0.5 nanoseconds times two is one nanosecond. And that would make my data rate one over my bit period or one gigabit per second. Does that, does that make sense? I think so. So I guess we're looking for like pretty much like right when it's going to be stable slash when it is like, or I guess like if it's close, like let's say like for mine, it started to get stable around like point like three, it would be point three times two and I'd get 0.6 nanoseconds, and then I do one over the bit period to get my data rate. Yeah. Okay. That makes a lot more sense now. Okay. Just make sure also that another important point is you're measuring everything in this in middle point, right? Don't don't measure it here. Measure it in you know where the where it's in between. Does that, make, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions, guys? Uh, for the average power, do you want us to do the RC delay thing where we calculate the capacitance of the gates too? Or are we just gonna do just a regular in, uh, like in between capacitor load? Yeah. Or, I would just simulate it, just so look at the look at the current getting drawn from the supply over some period of time. So just get like a few transitions in there and divide it by the amount of time. Okay, sounds good. Any other questions, guys? Oh, wait, could you say that again about uh, calculating the average power using like the simulation? Sure. So what I would do to get the average power is, let's say you've got, let's say you take out um, two, three periods. So the output's gonna do, I don't know, it's gonna do like that. And oops. So what you can do is you can look at the whoops. The funky code. So you've got your VDD connected here, right? Your supply. So you can basically get the current coming out of the supply over say I don't know, whatever period you want to make it make it make it an even number of clocks okay so from here to here so from here to here you can get sort of the current coming out of basically there's like an average measurement you can use that or you can actually look at the current coming out of your, your supply and then divide it by the amount of time this took. The reason for that is, remember that only when the output is transitioning high do you get current coming out of your supply. So you gotta get you got to, that's your current during that time. There's current coming from your supply. The rest of this time, there's no current coming from your supply. 
So you'll get some kind of a peak current here. Now go to zero and then some kind of peak current here. That's also a variant. So peak current, peak current. So you want to average that. I mean, you could do it over one cycle, but you want to average that power over this whole time. Does that does that make sense? Uh, I think so. So was it I divide the uh, like um, the volt? Did you say the voltage over time? No. So the so the power the so the power as a function of time is the supply times the current as a function of time. Oh, okay, that makes more sense. Right, and remember the current as a function of time changes. So this is the instantaneous power. If you want the average power, what you do is you take the integral of the instantaneous power over a certain period of time and divide it by that period of time. Was that remember we I think we had that in the the, the um, and we were looking at the power is it the power consumption slide decks or we were looking at the current slide decks. So when you're doing a simulation, the thing is you're only pulling current periodically, not always. So when you, you want to sort of calculate the total amount of current somehow measure that with your simulation. You want to multiply, you know, you can do it all in splice with a dot measure statement. I think, I think dot measure, if you look at a dot measure statement, if you use it carefully, I think you can get dot measure A, B, G, and then you can get the average power or average current, et cetera. And you want to multiply, if you're getting the average current, you want to multiply that by the supply and then you're okay. So over some over some period of time. Would it be okay if we use the average tool that you can get from the graph on the capacitor? Because there's a tool you can do in the LT splice where it uh, multiplies the supply to the current on the capacitor. And then you can, uh, I think it's control click or alt click that portion of the graph and then it gives you the average power. I see. Over that period. Uh, yeah. If, if, it, if that's what it's doing, yeah. Okay. I'm actually not sure how it works. So as long as you. As long yeah, as I, I have I have screenshots. But... Okay. Just I think the key thing to remember is that the important thing about this average power that I want you guys to to learn and by doing is realizing that the current's not always flowing from the power supply. It's only happening some of the time. And so you, you basically, you know, you measure the total current over some period of time and you divide it by that amount of time to get the average power. So another thing to be careful about when you're doing those kind of sims, like or trying to calculate average power, is again I think I just mentioned this now. But if you do something like this, let's see. If you take your time period from here to here, notice you don't you get two rising. Well, I threw that wrong. Let's say if you take it from here to here. So let's use that as, as your period. Notice you get two rising transitions and only one falling transition. So what you want to do when you want to get an average power is you want to make sure it's an even number of transitions. Okay, so you want to get, you know, if you're if you've got two rising transitions, make sure you got two falling transitions. Okay, because if you're looking at the output again, you're only drawing current when you have rising transitions. 
So if you use a shorter value, I only saw two rising transitions and one falling transition. It looks like your average power is higher than it really is because, because the, this rest of this time, you wouldn't have pulled any power from the supply. So you could have divided by a longer, by a longer T and get a lower average current. So just make sure that you're catching a whole number of- The whole period? The whole period. Whole periods. Okay, any other questions, guys? Um, so is that current measured from, so in the case of the drivers, is that measured from the power supply? Yeah, and you wanna catch the power supply, you wanna have this also get all your intermediate stages too. So, if they're all connected to the same power supply, like, is it possible that we make like separate VDDs for each one and then just measure the current through the power supply? Yeah, we just sort of have to add all the power. Like, is that is that how we're supposed to be doing it? Yeah, I would just hook them up to the same power supply and measure it off of one. To get average current. Yeah. Average current for all of them. Okay. It's not the average current per. So again, remember that your boss, what this person told you is they're giving you the task of designing the circuit, okay? So when they told you to design the circuit, they're gonna tell you it has a certain drive, it has a certain requirement to be driven. And when they're telling you like, hey, you have this much power consumption, this is your like power consumption budget, they don't wanna just know the power consumption of part of your circuit. They wanna know the power consumption of your whole circuit. Does that, does uh, that make sense, Sophia? Uh, regarding that, like configuration, um, like I asked before about like the project two wording stuff. So I wasn't sure we were supposed to refer to project one, and so um, I basically uh, sized up from one twenty microns. Is it fine to leave it like that, or do we have to like? Because like when I, I think when I scaled up from one twenty microns um the output current was about like 30 milliamps when i started from like 9.8 milliamps so it's not the output current is not really like 10 milliamp that you wanted but i i didn't know we were supposed to use the first inverter of the project one so honestly i'm still confused so you're saying this is so so this is what you what size is this so that would be like 1000 microns oh. be because I sized. So the part one was sizing it so that it outputs 10 milliamps. Yeah. So then I took that into, I took that inverter as the first one. And then I scaled up by multiples of three. Yeah, yeah. So you have to make this one 10 milliamps. So, so when I designed it in part one, um, I would scale down from that or yeah, because so, if yeah. I have to make the last one, the, the, the other one. So if I have to make that one 10 milliamps, um, I, I kind of have to restart my project. that I did for like a week. 
So I'm just kind of wondering. Yeah. And like, it looks like in the chat, other people like misunderstood the project wording as well. Let me, let me see how confusing this gets. Hmm. Well, I don't know what to tell you. I guess turn it in and I guess I'll see how reasonable it looks. Any other questions, guys? Uh, Ruben just asked in chat, are you going to post this lecture? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll put this up right now. Thank you. Sure. Okay, guys, if there are no other questions, I'll let you guys go. Thank you, Professor. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.